Hi, welcome to the bathtub. This is Scott Bradfield, and this is another one of our special theme episodes of the bathtub this week. We're having the uh, the all scabby faced, all scabby faced edition of the bathtub. I have all these little tiny scabs. In the effort to make myself beautiful for literature, I went to the dermatologist and they burned off all these little tiny things. So I have little tiny scabs all over my face. My wife says you shouldn't. She said you shouldn't do your video this week because you've got these spots all over, these horrible spots, even nor worse than I normal spots, and they're just little scabs that just keep falling off. It's disgusting. And I and I decided I had to do the class now while I didn't look good. Because one of the things I want to teach, one of the most important lessons I have to teach everybody, is that uh, uh, reading great books in the bathtub isn't necessarily pretty. Okay? It's not pretty. It doesn't make you smarter. It doesn't make you more clever. It doesn't make you... Uh, uh, it's more successful. It, ideally, it makes you happier. Okay, on the inside, it makes you happier, and that's what we're we're struggling for: is a, a happier, more pleasant life while everything falls apart. All right, this week um, we're going to talk about a writer who I haven't I, I really enjoyed reading in the bathtub this week, and that is Stanislaw Lem. You may have heard of him. He's he's he was a, he's a Polish, he was known as a Polish science fiction writer, but it's kind of hard to call him a science fiction writer. His stuff is more fabulous and fantastic than that. Um, the first time I read a Lem novel all the way through, this is the old, I love these old editions from Avon um, with these kind of beautiful old covers. So you should, if you can find these, they're kind of actually becoming pricey for some reason. Uh, this is the old edition I read of the Siberiad. I read this 35 years ago. I was in grad school in UC Irvine. I, I, your best books you remember vividly reading. I was in grad school, and I had a terrible flu, and I was sick as a dog. One of those few times I remember I was so sick, I literally couldn't leave the house. I had this terrible flu, and this was one of the books I had picked up on the shelf. It was on the shelf, and I started reading this Siberia. I had no idea what it was about, and I can't recall it very vividly as far as the specifics. I re recall the pleasure of reading it enormously. And it's a kind of a science fiction version of A Thousand and One Nights. So it's, it's much shorter, so it's a couple hundred pages. But there are lots of short stories told by these two crazy robots, as I recall. And a lot of the stories have to do with gigantic crazy robots wandering the galaxy. And that makes it sound terrible. It's not a very att attractive description. But they're kind of these brilliant, com complex conundrums. They're like these kind of Borgesian riddles that filled with, with funny, humorous stories, and the characters are quite lively and crazy, and you can't put it down. It's just a lovely, fun, entertaining book, which even when you have a 102 degree temperature, whatever I had, it's just really, really pleasurable. So I have, for some reason, I never read him again. I, I've, I've nosed around at Stanislaw Lem over the years. I have a lot of his books, and um, so this week, for some reason, I don't know why, I just saw it on the shelf. I, I read one of his early novels called *The Investigation*, and again, they're, they're, it's hard to call them. They're always published as he's he's known as the greatest, I guess, Polish science fiction writer. But it's hard to call them science fiction stories. Uh, this is more like a fabulous series of fables. And this, what's interesting about *The Investigation* is it's a completely different book from *The Siberian*. Um, it, it, there's, it, it's, they're almost like different writers, but there's the same intelligence behind them, the same narrative uh, 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 tension. And, and you really start reading this book, just like the Siberian, and I couldn't really put it down for a couple of days. I had a couple of great bathtubs and, and in the afternoons read, read through it too. And I'm going to give a quick s summary of it. It has a kind of a, ca a Kafka-esque, he's often compared to Kafka, a bit of a Kafkaesque quality because it has to do with a, some bureaucrats. There's, it's set in London, a city obviously that Lem didn't know that well, so he's kind of inventing London as he goes through it. And it's, a, it's an investigation into a series of events where dead bodies in morgues are somehow getting up and walking around, and a couple of them disappear. That's the that is and no one really witnesses. You never really witness these fantastic events in the course of the book. The investigation is about a, 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 a an investigator. I want to say is Lieutenant Gregory, Lieutenant Gregory, who was assigned to this case, and it's basically him going around getting evidence of things. So in the first forty or fifty pages, there's a really long opening scene where he's given a report 
about this occurrence. And, and, and there's a kind of a density of detail, which you think would be boring, but he keeps, he, there's something about the way Lem tells the story and pre presents the details. And just giving details is very important in the, in the, in the concept of this book. So it's, it's, it's not lots of things happening. It's the details of every piece of information they have about these events. And then about 40 pages, 50 pages into it, Lieutenant Gregory goes off where another body has disappeared. And we have another 40 or 50 page scene where Lieutenant Gregory simply goes through the scene of this place where a body has disappeared and where a policeman has been hit by a car. And we don't really know anything that's happened except as Gregory goes through, he gives us bits of information. He, he addresses people and he gets asks people questions and he investigates the scene of the, of the car that's crashed. And we just get this, this series of details coming at us, which, again, sounds boring, but they're just absorbing. It's very absorbing. And you don't know what's happening, and you slowly get some idea. Now, uh, as, the, as the course of the book goes on, the central dramatic uh, conflict in the, in the story is between this investigator and a guy who I want to say is named Sis, I forget. I think it's called Sis. He's basically a statistician, and this guy, this statistician, has been brought in to help understand what's been going on with all these bodies disappearing, and he has somehow assembled so much data, he thinks he can predict what's going to happen. That's really the, I don't want to give you much more than that, because that's the, the, the central drive of the book, is that you can't really understand why things happen, but you can assemble information about why things happen. And through just the data itself and the, the, the frequency or non-frequency of events, you can start to predict things. Now, it's tongue-in-cheek. There's a bit of tongue-in-cheek. There's a lot of sort of these type of philosophical arguments between Gregory and Sis, and he starts to follow him around. And there's always odd things happening in the, in the course of the book, such as the, the uh, Lieutenant Gregory lives in this boarding house where there's this weird noise is always happening in the other room. <laughs> that's, that's, that's like living in London, by the way. You live in London, there's always some weird hammering or banging like two doors down from where you live. And, uh, it, and in the course of the book, he goes next door and sees this very peculiar scene, which you could almost believe in London. Um, finally, there, there, there becomes a part in the book where the, the central characters start to explain what they think is happening. And we get two or three theories one has to do with the idea that that cancer in bodies creates a kind of conflict between the healthy body and the cancerous body. And the cancerous body sometimes is struggling to control the body. And it can control, I don't want to go too far because it's just this, it's, it goes on for several pages in the description, and controls the body and eventually starts to locomote it around. That's just one of the crazy ideas that starts to come up. And it's done in such a convincing manner that it doesn't seem crazy. I thought I'd read just a little passage here, which I, I liked. I don't normally like to skip to the kind of one of the argumentative passages, but about 139, um, who is the guy's? It's Sis, S-C-I-S-S. -S. He, he starts to talk about, uh, there's a conference, there are a bunch of people standing around talking, and they start talking about how rationalism isn't really effective. And, and he goes on to say, uh, nowadays, rationalism is the fashion, not the method. And superficiality is always one of the characteristic features of fashion, Sis said coldly, ignoring the writer's sarcasm. At the end of the 19th century, it was universally believed that we knew almost everything there was to know about the material world, that there was nothing life, nothing life to do, there was nothing in life to do except keep our eyes open and establish priorities. The stars moved in accordance with calculations not very different from those needed to run a steam engine. The atoms, too, and so forth. A perfect society was attainable, and it could be constructed bit by bit according to a clear-cut plan. In the exact sciences, these naively optimistic theories were abandoned long ago, but they are still alive in the thought processes of everyday life. So-called common sense relies on programmed non-perception. So to be to, to act commonsensical, you have to blank out all the weird things that this, this dispute your rationalism. Uh, program non-perception, concealment or ridicule of everything that doesn't fit into the conventional 19th century vision of a world that can be explained down to the last detail. 
Meanwhile, in actuality, you can't take a step without encountering some phenomenon that you cannot understand and will never understand without the use of statistics. So it's a sci if there's a science fiction element, the scientist is a statistician arguing that statistics is the only way you can understand things. So it's almost a kind of a, a, a refutation of the kind. We talked a little bit about the analog, the astounding science fiction and the, the, the science fiction of you know rational determinism, understanding the universe through through knowledge. And and it's sort of I'm saying you don't understand it. You can assemble you assemble data and that's it. Um, that that kind of makes it sound a little more dry. It's actually a very entertaining book. The conflict between two characters is really fascinating. It gets better and better as you move on. I enjoyed every page of both books I've read by Lem, and I can't. Com I, I, they're totally different books. Um, I would say two or three other things. Most of his stuff has had problems with translations. This I thought was a terrific translation by someone named Adele Milch. I don't know. The, the translation seemed really good, but it has tons of typos in it. I don't know if they ever corrected this. This is what happens with a lot of translations. It's a really neglected art in the past 50 years. And they don't always, oh, look, my collars are sticking up. They don't always uh, uh, do them properly. But there's a ton of typos in this. It's a bit annoying. I think it was one in the one I, I just read. The other thing I was going to say here is it's good to get the old Kindle out because we haven't really done a, done a book on Kindle. And so, uh, Stanislaw Lem is best known for a novel called Solaris. Solaris was made into a trendy movie by Tarkovsky, I want to say. Don't, don't write in about my translations, I swear to God. I swear to God. I'll come to your house and you start complaining about my, my, how I pronounce people's names. Tarkovsky, I think. He also did Tracker. These are really, really trendy, considered the great, you know, great uh, postmodern films from Russia. And uh, I personally have never been able to watch them all the way through. I find them a little boring. Uh, Stanislaw Lem didn't like Tarkovsky's version of Solaris. But Solaris is his best known book because of that trans that that film version. And then uh, Steve Soderbergh and George Clooney did a version about 10 or 15 years ago, which I watched. And it is it's also boring. I think it's a very boring film, despite Soderbergh, who's, who's awfully good. Um, it's about a sentient planet, and and neither of those movies will give you a flavor of Lem. One of the things it turns out happened is that the only English language translation of Solaris for decades was a translation into French, which was translated from French into English, I believe. Anyway, it was a double translation, which is not going to bode well. It's not, it's not gonna, that's not going to have a happy ending, folks, when you translate uh, someone as complex as Lem into one language and then into English, which is what they did. Uh, several years ago, and I didn't know this until I d prepared for this little talk, um, so, uh, Solaris was translated again. It's on, uh, it's on Kindle. It's a nice little cover for it. You can't get the new translation in a book form by a guy named Bill Johnston. I have not read this translation, but it is from the original Polish. Bill Johnston translated another, at least one other book by, by Lem. And if you want to read Solaris, you can get it on Kindle for about three or four bucks. You have to make sure you get the Bill Johnson translation, okay, and then you will get a translation that's from Polish into English and not this, you know, circuitous around around the horn, go, going around the Cape Cape of Good Hope to get it translated. It's a direct translation. And so I thought I think we'll definitely do Solaris you know, someday in the bathtub. Uh, I I really recommend this guy. He's real. He's a real wild, a wild character, and he's he's a, just a really funny, interesting intelligence. I don't know enough about him to say anything except that he's he's a good read. Um, finally, I don't know if we'll do it next week or not, uh, but I should bring in his little news. I don't usually do news. The great American short story writer uh, Carol M. Schwiller died this week, or just yesterday, possibly. And this is the collected stories. This also is terribly it's got more typos in it than you want to get. She wrote. Dozens and dozens and dozens of marvelous, strange short stories. Over 60 years, 70 years, she, was, she died at 92. She wrote for a long time. She was a very good short story writer, very funny. She's been categorized as magic realism, as science fiction, as fantasy. There's no real categorization for a writer like her or for Lem. And uh, I will definitely do something with Carol Amishwiller. But just to, to say, uh, this, uh, it's... She was. She is an important uh, short story writer, 
and she will be missed. Okay, Stanislaw Lem, go find it. If you can get these copies, go get them. Beware of the translations of Solaris if you want to start with his most famous book. It's supposed to be great. I've, I've always been put off by the movies. Okay, we'll see you soon.